family and friends, there really is a sense that God wants to move us on, and put that thing down a bit, okay, so God wants to move us on, and this thing wants to move off my face, <laughs> come here in the name of the Lord, <laughs> okay, there we go, um, and I really do feel that what uh, we're going to look at in the Word, and it's always a privilege to open up the Word of God, because there is power in the Word of God. God chose to speak those billions and billions of galaxies into existence. So when God speaks, He releases seed, and that seed, if we receive it, and we create the right atmosphere in our lives, can grow into something really wonderful. And so we're busy looking at the way the Lord Jesus described the Gospel. The gospel, you can summarize in one sentence, but it is, has immense consequences. And um, Jesus used parables to tell us simple stories to describe the different aspects of the gospel. And we're going to continue with that this morning. And it's going to really flow nicely into the flow of the ministry up to this point. Um, just a few general comments. Life is sort of uncomfortable at the moment. Um, there's much that gives us reason to be concerned with. I mean, the political situations, I don't think it's ever been this messy. Uh, economically, politically, there's racial tension in the country. It's kind of a collapse of the moral fiber of the nation. So as we look, uh, there's enough to keep us concerned. And these are kind of really sobering times because we're wondering what's the future going to be like for our children and for our grandchildren and how we to respond. And Jesus gave us a parable to help us. It's in Mark chapter 13. If you turn there with me in your Bibles. Mark chapter 13, and it's a very, very simple story. And we're going to look at a few aspects of it this morning. He says, But about the day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So this was something that Jesus repeated regularly. Because he says, what I'm telling you now, I'm te I've told everybody that I've come into contact with. And that is, keep watch. And so I want to talk a little bit this morning on being alert and keeping watch. The parable is um, really very simple. Uh, it deals with a servant who gets given charge of his master's house and the master goes away and will return suddenly uh, and uh, encourages the servant to be ready when he returns. So why is it so important to keep watch and to keep alert? Well, Jesus says he's going to return suddenly when no one expects him. He may return before the end of this sermon. How many of you would really welcome that? And how many of you would be a bit nervous, <laughs> a bit cautious, and say, well, let's just have Sunday lunch that I've put in the oven before you come, Lord. Or, so he might return suddenly, and he's going to catch a lot of people off guard when he returns. And the second reason is, when he returns, he returns as a judge. He returns to bring to all of us a moment of accountability. The Apostles' Creed says, And he shall come again, it's he's returning again, to judge the quick and the dead. Those aren't the quick that can get out of his judgment before he makes the judgment. The quick is an old word for alive. So he's coming to judge those that are alive and those that are dead. And there's a kind of a rider that Jesus gives us that's a bit unsettling. It's in 
uh, Mark chapter se- uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. He says, Many will say to me on that day, that's the day that he returns, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? A whole lot of us don't even qualify to fall into that category. Therefore I tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So there's a measure of kind of trepidation in our hearts as we to keep watch for this day that Jesus comes. And so five times in four verses, he says, uh, be alert and be on your guard. In verse 33, he says, be on guard, be alert. Verse 35, he says, keep watch. Verse 36, he says, do not sleep. And Raymond kind of encouraged us to suddenly leap into activity <laughs> uh, so if we wake it up in the morning. And then in the last one, verse 37, he says, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And so, as I said, this is a simple story. It's not e- difficult to understand. And what Jesus is trying to tell us is that we to live life consciously, intentionally and without any form of complacency. So, what do we need to watch out for? Where, in what areas do we need to be alert? And I've got three of them and uh, we'll work through them and after that we'll be finished for this morning. The first area we need to be alert and watch out for is the signs of the times. As we look at history unfolding before our eyes, Jesus says, be alert. Be aware of what is going on around you. Um, Be aware of the currents that are kind of flowing strongly in life. Look at the seasons. Look at, open up your newspaper, look at the TV, and look, really look, and be on your guard and watch. Um, There are two prophetic voices that uh, kind of ring uh, make a resonance with me as far as truth is concerned. The first one is a lady, she's a doctor, Dr. Patricia Green. Anybody heard of her? Okay, we're going to hear about her now. <laughs> she's an American lady. She comes with a quite a solid track record in the prophetic. She prophesied the first uh, black American president in Obama before the Democratic Party had chosen him as their candidate. So it was between him and Hillary Clinton before he was elected the first time and it looked as if Clinton was going to get the vote. She stood up and she prophesied that Obama would get the democratic kind of election and he'd go on to become the American president. No one believed her. She then prophesied at the similar time that Donald Trump would win the next election. And I mean that was against the run of play. And so she prophesied those two things very accurately. So she comes with a measure of a track record. She says the following, I will show my children what I'm about to do on the earth through my prophets. My prophets will arise with this proclamation, make way for the coming of Jesus, prepare the way, prepare your hearts. So it's like that John the Baptist ministry that's going to rise again in our time. So the focus of the prophets is going to be prepare the way for the coming of the Lord because he's coming soon. And then she says these words, she says, He will shake the heavens and he will shake the earth with his outstretched arm. This great shaking will usher in great revival. So that's hectically positive on the one side. The churches whose foundations are not established on the rock of Jesus will fall. Many will be shocked at the churches which fall because those churches put up a good front but refuse to live in holiness. I will expose the greed, the fornication, the adultery, and the idolatry of these churches. There is a great shake in coming, and I will expose the sin, repent before it is too late. So John the Baptist came with a message of repentance. Get your life right. So when we look at all these signs, when we see how dark things are, we should be alert and watch and make sure that our lives are in order, waiting for the coming of the King. Are you with me? Um, and so she says there's going to be this great revival. We all long for the revival. But it's going to come as a result of or in the midst of a shaking. This nation is going through a shaking at the moment. All those firm foundation stones that we put our lives on and around, our pension funds, etc., etc. 
So those things have been shaken at the moment. The economy, the future has been shaken. Out of it is going to come a revival. People flooding into the kingdom. But at the same time, you're going to see churches that are not established on the Lord Jesus Christ fall. Um, and so that's one prophetic word. The second one is from a guy called Jeremiah Johnson. He's also a, a prophet. He says God spoke the word polarization to him in the church. So in other words, you're going to have two diametrically opposed views um, kind of in the church. And he said they're going to go around two areas. The first area is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So he says, In an open vision I saw the ministry of the Holy Spirit being substituted and replaced like never before in various parts of the body of Christ. In 2017, some churches are going to engage in entertainment and fleshly driven marketing techniques that the earth has never seen before. Parts of the church are going to give themselves to becoming a subculture for the world. I heard the Lord say the false gospel that produces false converts will spread like wildfire in 2017. Church attendance, the number of church services, the financial increase will deceive many who are looking for soulish confirmation of success. Church leaders who started the ministry being led by my spirit will begin to drift away my voice in 27, drift away from my voice in 2017 and operate from a realm of man-pleasing and flesh. So you're going to have those that genuinely are going to pursue the Holy Spirit. It's going to be uncomfortable, awkward. And you're going to have those that entertain and pander to the masses. You're going to kind of have this polarization of thinking around the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then the second thing he says is around the apostolic ministry. The way that we look at the Holy Spirit and the way that we do apostolic ministry. He says, Of the five ministries functioning in the body of Christ, the greatest level of deception is operating in apostolic ministry. I mean, that's something that we're fully aware with. We spotted our foundation, the apostolic ministry. So there's coming an increase in polarization to this ministry. On the one hand, you will witness true apostles rise and walk in authentic apostolic ministry. But on the other hand, you will see false prophets rise who will spread soulish and false apostolic ministry. I saw God raising up apostolic preachers who will, pro who will proclaim Christ Jesus and all of His glory. These fiery heralds will help usher in revival to the church centered upon the knowledge of God and encountering the person of Jesus. Now listen to these, these next words and see how they kind of fit over the movement that we part of. Apostolic ministry that does not recognize that to gain revelation concerning Christ is everything and to forfeit it is futile is not authentic apostolic ministry. The primary calling of all true apostles is to unveil the glorious person of Jesus Christ to his body. Apostles have been commissioned by the Father himself to uncover and reveal Jesus Christ as the foundation, the cornerstone, the head of the church, True apostles consistently teach, preach, and prophesy on the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and second coming of Jesus Christ. If he himself is not their central focus and message, they are not legitimate apostles. Amazing, eh? I mean, Tyron, who kind of leads our family, has received criticism from many people saying, stop preaching about Jesus so much. Move on to some, something else. Surely there's something more than just Jesus, 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 the King and His kingdom. And you have a prophetic word in amazing confirmation of that. So the first thing we need to guard and be alert, of and be alert about and be aware of is the signs of the times. And the signs of the times are pointing very clearly to the, re the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called as a people to be raised up in this hour to call many to a place of genuine repentance. One of the things that is kind of fixated me at the moment is that there are false conversions. I never considered that years back. But there are people that think they've come to Christ and they haven't come to Christ. It is so important that there's genuine repentance, genuine uh, receiving of the Lord Jesus into your heart and genuine working out of His Lordship in Christ. Otherwise, Jesus is going to say, many said to me, many said to me, a few were genuinely converted and so that's our challenge, to preach a gospel of repentance as we watch and as we see the signs of the times. 
The second area that we need to watch over is to watch over our own souls. And I would ask you this morning, how goes it with your soul? <laughs> In uh, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, 3 John, there's only one chapter there. 3 John, verse 2, it says, Dear friends, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So, our soul has this ability to get along well or get along badly. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. So when we continue to walk in the truth, our soul prospers. In other words, it gets healthier and stronger and bigger and puts on more muscles. And I don't know exactly how it all works out, but it gets better. It doesn't get worse. And so we're encouraged to watch over our soul. Faithfulness to the truth of God's Word will result in our, our soul prospering as our physical body prospers in good health. We are meant to travel or journey deeper into maturity. 1 John 2, 6 says, Walk as Jesus walked. And so we to watch and to be alert and to guard our soul so that we uh, walk as Jesus walked. Jesus walked in obedience. Out of his obedience flowed holiness. Jesus walked in love. And out of his love flowed compassion. Jesus walked in fruitfulness. And out of fruitfulness flowed intentional ministry. And so uh, my question has to be, are you aware of any areas of disobedience in your life? which would rob you of holiness before God? Are you aware of any lack of, of hard-heartedness, lack of love that would interfere with your compassion for people? Are you aware of areas of barrenness and just desert areas in your life where there's no fruitfulness? Watch over these things and then uh, do the necessary to put them right. One of the, one of the, the scriptures I actually read at the prayer meeting is from Colossians 1, verse 10. And Paul says these words, he says, We have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing Him in every way. And so Paul prays that we would increase our knowledge or our revelation of the will of God for our lives. See, God's will is wrapped up in His nature and His character. So if you know the will of God, you can understand His character and His nature. And so Paul says it's really important that as you journey through life, you increase your revelation and your knowledge of the will of God. Because if you do that, you'll do things that please Him and you'll live a life worthy of the name of Christian that you carry, or the name Jesus that you carry. Uh, and so Paul encourages us in these things. What fires you up with passion for Christ? What is it that you do, what activity that you engage in that causes you to come alive for Christ? Chanel, this is going out to the world too, but on some property now. <laughs> Serving me. I haven't noticed that so much in the past. <laughs> I'm <not even> joking. <laughs> There's different pathways or avenues God has got to each single person. What works for one guy doesn't work for the other guy. We are colleagues and friends who get energized by sitting in a coffee shop. That would freak me out no end. <laughs> they do their prep, their sermon prep in a coffee shop. Noise, clutter, drinking coffee. And it just energizes them. For me, it's, I've told you so often before, it's getting on my bicycle and riding three, four hours out on my own with uh, worship music and sermons that I listen to. I get energized by that. What energizes you? Is it the quiet walk in the forest? Is it sitting at the beach? Is it in the midst of Greenacre Shopping Center on a 
payday <laughs> morning. What energizes you? Is it shopping maybe? I see a lot of people get energized through shopping, including me. But um, what energizes you? Please, please guard and watch that thing and do it more and more and more. Whatever it is that feeds your soul, we want our soul to prosper, to get stronger as these times will get more and more difficult. So whatever it is, and you'll know that for yourself, whatever that activity is, might be sitting in the garage just making things and working on things or servicing your car. Whatever it is that gives you passion for Christ and for His kingdom. Um, for me, I've learned over the years that when the music dies in someone's heart, they drift away from God. When you stop listening to praise worship in the car, and you'd rather listen to News 24 or something, when, you, when the song of the Lord dies in your heart, and you don't have consciously a kind of melody playing in your heart. I mean, many of us wake up with the song, a worship song, ringing in our ears. Or am I the only one? <laughs> There's a song. When the song dies, we start drifting away. And so whatever it is, watch, be alert, and make sure that uh, you lean into the pathway that Christ uh, has specifically designed to get your attention. And then part of God in your soul, um, which we also pick up in that scripture in 3 John, he says, Dear friends, you are faithful in what you're doing for the brothers and the sisters. Even though they are strangers to you, they have told the church about your love. Please send them on, on their way in a manner that honors God. So these guys had a relational component to their life. They were at peace relationally. Um, and everybody told stories about the love and the hospitality that they received when they came to these folk that John was writing to. And so if we have a whole lot of broken relationships around us, it's going to impact on the health of your soul. And so I'm encouraging you to live relationally healed with people not with grudges and bitterness and anger in your heart to anyone. Live at a place where you have peace relationally. It starts in the home. If you don't have brothers and sisters or moms and dads that you haven't spoken to for 15, 20, 30 years, those issues have to be sorted out. They eat at your soul. They weaken your soul. And so another way of watching and guarding our souls is to make sure that we relationally as best as we can, living in a place of peace with everybody. So the first thing about watching is to watch the signs of the times, and they're there for those who want to see. The second thing is to watch and be alert over our soul. And the third one is to watch the harvest. In John 4, verse 35, Jesus says, don't you have a saying, it is still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the harvest field. They are ripe for harvest. So Jesus says, be alert, be on your guard, and look at the harvest field. It might seem to you that everyone in your life hates God and wants nothing to do with Him. But Jesus says, look, really look. And you will see that the harvest fields are white. He carries on and he says, You will reap where others have sowed. God has been preparing the hearts and the minds of people for years and years and years. Other people have been sowing the seeds and you get the privilege of reaping the crop. There was a, before I was asked to lead um, this church, Rob Rufus came to Port Elizabeth and we had a great weekend with him. I mean, many of us can still remember those Holy Spirit fire tunnel wild weekends. And I was, the stage was, yeah, I think, before we even moved it there. Uh, I was sitting on a chair over there in the front row watching me in this kind of circle. And I felt the power of God kind of fall on me in a really different way. And I began to slide off the chair. So I was listening, listening, and I kind of felt myself slow down under this weight 
So if someone says I'll slid till you can just show us. <laughs> slid off the chair on the ground. And boom boom boom. The head against the bottom of the chair. And I lay on the ground. And I started to cry and cry and cry and cry and cry. There was this heavy presence. And the only thing I can remember, and I can't say it was an audible voice, but this one thought that came through my head was God saying, too many of my children are not sleeping at home. Too many of my children. So those that are parents, they have little ones, and they go sleep over for the first time. That's an anxious <laughs> evening that you go through. Are they for the first time? Is it only me or is it other people as well? You're nervous. You lean your little, little precious bundle out of your life for this evening. They're going to go visit and play with friends. And you sit the whole night thinking, are they safe? Are they okay? Are they warm? Are they having, do they have enough food? And it was that kind of feeling, that kind of anxiety and stress. God says, too many of my children are not sleeping at home. Too many of his children that should be in the family are alienated from the family, sleeping somewhere else. When I was growing up, um, for a few years we lived with my granny and grandpa, and they stayed at the end of, at the back of their house was a, a road that was a dead end. It was just two houses and the dead end. So there was, and people in those years didn't really have many cars either, so there was no traffic in that road. And we used to go play cricket. It was a narrow little lane, not really a road, a little lane. And we played cricket right through till it got dark. And often my mom would have to stick her head over the fence and say, stop that, come in, dinner's ready. I thought God saying that as well. Come into the family. Dinner's been served. The banquet table's ready. The supper's been prepared. And many times you kind of had to drag our feet away from that cricket game that we were playing to go in and have this meal that my mom had prepared. Too many of God's children are not sleeping at home. Multitudes, multitudes, in Joel chapter 3, in the valley of decision. When God called Paul, he gave him this assignment in Acts chapter 26. Now get up and stand on your feet. So he was obviously in a relaxed, laying down position. Get up and stand in your, on your feet. I have appeared to you as I appointed you a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And that instruction, that mandate, comes through the centuries to us as we are seated here. God has appointed and instructed us to draw people from darkness into um, light. You know, I have a whole lot with me running out of time. Uh, let me just read John chapter 10 verse 16. It's a great scripture. Uh, John. Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. So Jesus says to us this morning, I have sheep that are not part of the sheep pen. I must go and get them and they will listen to my voice. Tremendous encouragement to us as we see the harvest and as we rise up and fulfill the role that God has called us to. And I'll finish with this. In Exodus chapter 11 and 12, the last plague, which was death to the firstborn. And so God announces that through Moses to Pharaoh. He still won't let the Israelites go. And so there was every firstborn, and you might have been 70 years old, but if you were a firstborn, you were a firstborn, or seven days old. Every firstborn, not only of the people, but of the cattle as well, 
And then further on another translation says of all animals. So we know definitely the cattle, possibly every single other animal was marked. Because when that angel of death went through um, Egypt and he killed every firstborn animal, pet, whatever, and firstborn sons, they were marked. Because the secondborn escaped free. And so they were marked for death. And when the angel of death came, you could see who the firstborn were and they were destroyed. The Israelites were marked for life. They had the Passover lamb, they had the blood on their doors. So when the angels came, he saw the blood on the door, he passed over. The reality of our life is, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you cannot honestly say that you're a son of God this morning, you are marked for death. Not only the folks sitting here who find themselves in that position, but multitudes, multitudes. They're walking like dead men walking, eh? like the title of that movie. And God says, watch, be alert. What is impossible for man is possible for God. We might see no harvest anywhere in our life. And God says, look, look carefully. There are people whose hearts have been prepared for years and years and years. Where we're going to reap where we haven't sowed. And so Jesus tells this very simple story. Watch, be alert. Watch the signs of the times. Watch the condition of your soul. And watch the harvest. And I think with what God is doing with us, and in us and through us, the life of the Spirit that's been just released, God has, a unique, has uniquely positioned us to draw the lost in, to draw those that have wandered from Christ, those that are marked for death, to change that thing, to rip it off them and place marked for life. And when Jesus, our Savior, comes, and we've sung songs about Him coming. Why don't you stand with me? <coughs> My great desire is that not one person would leave this hall or this facility still carrying the mark of death on them. I really would. You know where you stand. We encourage to look at the condition of our own souls and respond with repentance. And so if you're here this morning and you say, man, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. I want to settle this issue. I'm asking that you'll come down to the front. We're going to dismiss the, the, the guys. They're going to, we're going to continue the meeting with fellowship and prayer. But I don't want to miss the harvest that's right here this morning. And so I'm asking you to take a bold step, a courageous step. There'll be guys here ready to pray with you and to usher you into the kingdom and to remove off your life the mark of death and replace it through the blood of Jesus with the mark of life. And so this is really serious business. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask you guys to come down and then we're going to release the folk to go enjoy fellowship and tea with coffee. Father, we thank you for the parables, those simple, simple stories that you tell us, behind which is a mountain of truth that you want to release to us. And so, Father, as we consider this parable, the responsibility, the assignment that was given this man as his uh, master went away. Father, we do want to be alert as a people. We do want to wake up from any slumber. We want to realize and acknowledge the signs of the times. We want to acknowledge the condition of our own soul. And we want to stand with you and, and agree with you that indeed the harvest is white. And we will in our lifetime see those multitudes come out of those values of decision and bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray for every single heart here. The, your word impacts us all in different ways. I pray for those that know the pathways and the avenues into your presence, that just haven't walked down them for a long, long time, that the song would be restored in hearts once again. Work this out supernaturally through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that we'd receive a revelation of the will of the Father for us as a people and for our lives. Work these things out. Father, go beyond our words and our prayers. We're asking that you would intervene at the realm of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would, would suddenly 
cause explosions of life to take place in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.